What are two huge reasons for the Seattle Mariners' failure so far in 2024? Let's talk about it. So as I said, there are tons of reasons for why the Seattle Mariners are struggling so far in 2024, but I kind of just want to go over two main ones that in my opinion are huge factors into why they are struggling so far. Again, I'm sure you guys could name me a ton of reasons why the Seattle Mariners are struggling so far, but these are kind of just two that stand out to me and that I just really want to talk about with you guys that I've been noticing. So let's start off with number one, and that is their approach at the plate. As we know, going into this season, there was a whole new preface on the approach at the plate for the Seattle Mariners, and that was patience. And so far, the Seattle Mariners have been doing a very good job of being patient. So far, they are one of five teams in the major leagues to average four plus pitches per plate appearance this season. They only trail New York. Los Angeles, Colorado, and Pittsburgh. So there's no doubt they're definitely being more patient at the plate, whether it's working or not, and that's kind of what we're gonna talk about, but they are definitely being more patient. So just to go over three main categories that I kind of want to talk about in terms of this patience, and that is the walk percentage in which the Mariners are 18th in the league with an 8.7% walk rate, which again, not bad. It's definitely not a bad walk rate to have, but the patience really isn't working in terms of striking out because they are still second in the league, only behind Oakland with a 28.9% K rate. And also in terms of RBIs, the Seattle Mariners only have 49, which makes them 27th in the league, while the number one team is obviously the Dodgers, where they have 94. So they almost have double the amount of runs batted in than the Mariners do. So again, I want to make the point that the patience approach isn't my problem with all of this. My problem is when they're watching 92 to 94 mile an hour fastballs go right down the middle because they are trying to be patient. And I'm going to go talk about two guys that I want to mainly focus on that are known for being fastball destroyers and this season they are just not destroying them because they're getting deep into counts and just watching the fastballs go by one is a new seattle mariner and one is an old one if you want to call it that but one who's been here for a few years let's start off with the new seattle mariner and that is mitch garver it's not rocket science to see that mitch garver is clearly struggling so far in 2024 with the mariners and here's a bit of a reason why and i'm going to go into this based on his approach at the plate and he's one of the most frustrating ones for me because i just watch him literally take 94 mile an hour fastballs down the middle and if he does swing at them he's somehow late on them. He got a fastball right down the middle in the Cubs game yesterday that was 92 miles an hour and he was somehow late on it. So just to go over this, last year in 2023 against fastballs, Mitch Garver saw 700 fastballs in which he had a 299 batting average against and 12 home runs. So far in 2024, he's seen 95 fastballs and he has zero home runs as we know and he's hitting 182. And as expected going hand in hand with that against breaking balls in 2024, he's seen 77 of them and he's currently hitting 67 against it. So that lines up perfectly because he's watching fastballs go right down the middle and then he's getting breaking balls when he gets deep into these counts. And just in case you didn't believe that is not the approach, Julio Rodriguez is my next guy I'm gonna go over. And in 2023, he saw 1,351 fastballs in which he put out 14 home runs against and had a 293 batting average. Now let's slide up back into 2024 where he has seen 124 fastballs in which he has zero home runs and is currently hitting 206. And similarly with him, his batting average is worse against a breaking ball in which he's seen it 98 times and has a 200 batting average against. So again, my point here isn't the fact that they can't hit breaking balls. It's the fact that they're watching these fastballs go by, getting themselves behind in the count and then just getting nothing but breaking balls. Again, these guys destroy fastballs. I, they almost hit 300 against them last year. These are not guys that don't know how to hit a fastball or can't get their hands in on a fastball. Also, I'm not against the patience at the plate approach, but when you're getting a 91 to 93 mile an hour fastball like Assad was throwing yesterday, and we're just watching them go by because you want to be that patient approach, it's not working. Again, if Mitch Garver's approach to go up to the plate is to look for a middle in fastball on 00 count or a 20 count, that's perfectly fine. And he gets a 2-0 fastball that's on the outside corner. Don't swing at it. But the problem is, is they're under this mindset of being patient and they're not ready to go from the jump. So while to me, the patience approach at the plate is something that can work for them. They also need to be way more aggressive than they're being because they're just falling behind in couch and that's why they're striking out so much. So for me, that's big reason number one for the Seattle Mariners not succeeding so far in 2024. Moving into my second reason, and this part falls on Scott Service way more than it does anyone else, and that is consistency within the lineup. Again, I get the whole analytics thing. I use analytics in my videos all the time, as you guys know, and they definitely prove a lot of points. And being able to tell which batter best faces off against a pitcher is definitely something I, I don't disagree with. Again, at what point are we going to use a guy that's just solely better at baseball than another guy instead of just looking at the analytics? As we've discussed in the last video and been a main topic amongst Mariner fans is why is Luke Rayleigh not playing? And that's because he falls under this analytical category where if Scott doesn't feel like the matchup 
analytically favors Luke Rayleigh, he's just not going to play him. But right now, we are currently in a different situation now that Dom Canzone is hurt and we have Jonathan Class A coming up. As much as obviously I would like to see Class A succeed, I personally think that Luke Rayleigh should be getting tons of reps while Dom Canzone is not here. There's only so many times you can switch a lineup in a series without trying to find some consistency in it. I've always said that if you look at some of the best teams in the league or just overall in baseball, whether it's at the D1 level, D2 level, D3 level, that the best lineups are the ones that are consistent and ride out their guys whether they're struggling or not. So again, while Luke really has proved nothing in his whatever 23 ABs that he's had so far, he still is statistically better in his career than other guys that are playing. There's no reason that Luke really shouldn't have been playing in that first game against the Cubs against a guy from the, throwing from the left side hitting 91 to 93. He's not going to overpower him. And I am mainly talking about Luke Rayleigh because he is one of those main guys that falls into this category. And again, he is one of those guys that I think needs those consistent reps to really be able to succeed at the MLB level. So to me, playing him every fourth or fifth day is not something that's going to work for him. I can tell you right now it's not going to work. But again, until we've seen those reps, and I, I keep using Demo as well because he is our main utility guy who gets these reps if, if someone like Luke Rayleigh is sitting. At what point do you look at Luke Rayleigh's last season with the Rays and say that they this season was better than any season Demo's had in his entire career? And again, that's no shot at Demo. I think he's one of the best utility guys off the bench and he fits that role perfectly of being a utility guy and coming in when Scott analytically, again, needs that at bat in the eighth or ninth inning against a hard throwing lefty. So while some of you may disagree with this, just in my opinion, I think being able to shift the lineup and changing it up every single day to try to find something that works will never work because there's no consistency within that. So for example, if Jorge Polanco, you want him to be your three hitter all year, which of course we want Jorge Polanco to be our three hitter all year. Let's leave him in the three hole, whether he's struggling or not, leave him in the three hole. Just like you've been with JP Crawford. JP Crawford has been in the leadoff spot. He's struggling. He's not going to move from that spot. He knows that consistency is there and he's eventually going to figure it out. So that's just my opinion. I think that is one thing that needs to improve. And that's just the consistency within the lineup. I get the whole platoon thing. I get that it's a more common thing, especially nowadays, and that it does work in certain situations. But right now, we need to find consistency and we need these guys to figure it out and find their reps and know who they're hitting behind and just stuff like that, whether it's so minimal and you may think it's so dumb to even bring up, I do think that is very important. So those are just two big reasons why I think the Seattle Mariners are really struggling to figure it out so far in 2024, and I do really hope they can turn it around soon. But otherwise, please let me know what you guys think one of the big reasons is for their struggle so far in 2024. And otherwise, I hope you guys did enjoy the video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.